Good morning. Happy Lord's Day. That's right. Jesus said, I am Lord of the Sabbath. And the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So happy Sabbath. We're so glad to see each of you here. And all of our friends we know are watching on television now or one of the uh, various internet sites. We're just glad that we can come together and, and minister with you as well. Well, this is a, a special time of year when many of the people in the world are thinking about the subject of the incarnation and all of the mysteries that are connected with uh, how God could become a human, be 100% God and be 100% human. And admittedly, there's something of a mystery connected with that. So I thought it would be appropriate to be talking about the subject of the mystery of the Trinity. And so uh, we're going to be dealing with this subject. And uh, I'd like to begin with an amazing fact. We have um, a picture, I think, of the James Webb Space Telescope. And it's fascinating to me. I love science. And this telescope now, let me give you a few facts about it. Launched Christmas Day, 2021. It operates now about a million miles from the Earth. I think it's 980 million or 1,000. It took the world's best scientists 26 years and $10 billion to build this camera. Basically, it takes pictures, telescopic pictures. It has the largest mirror in a space telescope. It's coated with 24 karat gold. And it's a thousand times more powerful than the Hubble. If I held up a penny now, could you see the date? If, could you see the date a mile away? This can see the detail on a penny 24 miles away. And so you can imagine what it does up there in space without any interference. And when they first launched the Hubble, they thought, oh, well, we're going to now find out. We'll get to the outer ridges or rims of the universe. They thought maybe the Hubble was seen, you know, where the forest ends and the ocean of empty space begins. But instead what happened is when they started to get the first images back from the James Webb telescope, they thought, man, we haven't even gotten into the neighborhood yet. They thought they'd be seeing these very young galaxies that had just formed that were out near the edges and instead they were very mature and the deeper they looked, it went on and on and on. Now I say that, yeah, and there's some beautiful pictures there you can see, just it's amazing images how big must the God be that made all of that? So today, as we venture on holy ground to talk about the subject of the mystery of the Trinity, I thought about calling it the mind-boggling mystery of the Trinity. We are on holy ground because as high as the heavens are above the earth, Isaiah tells us in chapter 55, verse 6, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, how high are the heavens? So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So, you know, now as we begin to explore what the Word reveals about the subject of the Godhead, admittedly, we are on holy ground. This is a majestic mystery. Just to give you a few scriptures that help illustrate that, in Psalm 145, verse 3, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. In Romans 11, 33, I've got this passage here. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or become His counselor? I mean... When we say that we're going to sit down and explain God, you realize that we're way out of our pay grade. This is something that we're entering in on this study with humility. Job, he said in chapter 26, 14, Indeed, these are but the mere edges of His ways. And how small a whisper we hear of Him, but the thunder of His power, who can understand? John Wesley said, Show me a, mer a worm that can comprehend a man, and I'll show you a man that can comprehend God. So 
we have to know right out that uh, the one who made all of this, it, you would have to be God to be able to define him and bottle him and explain him. But he does reveal something about himself, and he says, come now, let us reason together. And so we're going to do our best to study the subject of God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And I know that this is a, a controversial subject. I post my sermon typically every Friday that I'm going to be preaching the next day on my Facebook page. And uh, ooh, a lot of comments when people saw the title. But uh, we're going to go by the Bible, right? I remember hearing a story about when the great theologian Augustine was trying to con contemplate the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and the subject of what we call the Trinity, that uh, he just was realizing it was such a, a big issue, and he was struggling and studying and writing and trying to get a book together on the subject, he realized he needed to take a break before his brain exploded. And he went for a walk on the beach, and while he was walking on the beach, he saw off in the distance a child that was running back and forth between the water and the sand. And as he got closer, he realized the child had a little pink seashell in his hand, and he'd run off to the ocean. He'd scoop up some water, he'd run back, and he was pouring the water down a crab hole. Then he'd run back, and he watched him, and he, the, the kid was so persistent, and finally he couldn't help, and he went up and said, uh, Child, what on earth are you doing? He said, Oh, mister, he said, I'm going to take all that water out there, and I'm going to put it in my hole. <laughs> and the Lord spoke to Augustine and said, That's what you're doing, in trying to say, You're going to understand me and define me. Uh, God is great and much bigger than we can understand. But those things that are revealed are for ours, and there are some things revealed. For one thing, the Bible is clear. There's one God. We are, as Christians, a monotheistic religion. Mono, one God, not stereo. Now listen carefully. As Moses said in Deuteronomy 4, or 6 verse 4, it's called the Great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your strength. You can read where Isaiah says, chapter 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and your Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Go to the New Testament, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. For there is one God. How many? But Paul said, of course, he's Jewish. He believed the Shema. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Well, is Jesus just a man? Or is he speaking about when Christ became a man? So, first of all, recognize a Bible fact that in the Bible, when it talks about one, one is not always talking about quantity. It's sometimes talking about quality. For example... You read in the Bible that uh, many can be one. You look in Genesis 2, verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and he will be bankrupt. No. A man will leave his father and mother, and he will cleave to his wife, and they become what? One flesh. And the word is echad. It means one. They're united. You look in the book of Judges, and I could give many examples in the Bible, but I've got so much to cover. I'm just trying to give you two or three witnesses on each point. In the book of Judges 20, verse 11, So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, united as one man. That means they're united. And then probably the best evidence is, look at what Jesus says in John 17, verse 20. He said, Father, I do not pray for these alone. This is his great intercessory prayer. I don't pray for these alone, but for those who will believe in me through their word. By the way, this is a prayer for you. If you believe in Jesus because of the word that you heard, he's praying for you. Amen. That they all might be one. Talking about the disciples, that they might be one. And the apostles, that they might be one. Notice, how are they one? As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us that the world might believe that you sent me. So we don't want to give up the oneness of God, but just know that one doesn't always mean numerical quantity. It's talking about unity. And so when we study the subject of what we call the Trinity, we're talking about the triunity or triennities. Now that word was first used 
um, years ago, I think it was Tertullian, back about 150 A.D. His life overlapped the life of the Apostle John. So the idea or the phrase Trinity, and as we study this, let me make it clear, different people, when they say Trinity, it means different things. If you talk to me about the word rapture, rapture is not in the Bible, the word. The teaching of being caught up, that's what the word means, is in the Bible. But if you talk to me about the rapture, I tell you, I got a different view than my Pentecostal friends about the rapture. Do you know the word Bible is not in the Bible? It's actually Biblos. <laughs> when we talk about the millennium, how many of you believe in the millennium? Every hand should have gone up if you haven't read Revelation 20. The millennium is talking about this thousand year period that follows the second coming. The word is not there. It is a composite of the two Latin words, mili annum, the thousand years. Nothing wrong with the word millennium. And so the same thing, don't be frightened by the word trinity. Recognize some people have a different understanding of it, and we're going to talk about that. But the teaching of these tri-entities that compose who we know as the one God, that's what we're talking about. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 28, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in what? The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice Jesus said not the names of, he uses the word name singular, of three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, there are some people struggling with various doctrines and there are scriptures they don't like and they say, well, that scripture doesn't belong in the Bible. Uh, I'm going at every subject believing that they all belong in the Bible. Uh, otherwise, you start picking and choosing which ones you want to believe are inspired, you're going to really have problems. Don't ever forget what I'm about to say. If you only remember this, if you're going to make a mistake of believing too much of the Bible or too little, believe too much and you'll be saved. Some people start picking and choosing and I actually sat down with a pastor who said something I just could not believe. I was arguing the theological subject with him, and I quoted Paul, and he looked at me and said, well, Doug, you know, a lot of things Paul said just aren't true. And I thought, you're pastoring a church? Because, boy, if one thing a pastor has, to, has square in his mind is that every word of God is pure. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, that's not denying that there are not some interesting verses in the Bible that need deeper study, but there's been a lot of study that went into compiling what we have that we might trust it, and I believe the Lord intervened in that. So um, some people argue, well, Jesus didn't really say that, or he's talking about the titles of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I've heard all kinds of creative arguments, but Jesus clearly said, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Notice what Paul says here as his benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Paul seems to recognize that those three entities are used in giving them a divine blessing. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God to cleanse your conscience from dead works. There again, you've got the Father, the Son, the Spirit. In Revelation 1, verse 4 and 5, right there at the beginning, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him, God, who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits, the Holy Spirit, before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. So even in the book of Revelation, it begins with a benediction of the blessing of God. An introduction, I should say. And then one of these verses that is what you would call a slam dunk that some people have a problem with. 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and who does John say the Word is? It's Jesus. The Father, the Word and the Holy Spirit, these three are one. If that makes sense, please say amen. amen. I always do better when I get your feedback. Romans, but oh wait, before I read that, let me just share something with you. So when we look at nature, uh, we can see something about that God is there. It's the what about God. It's when you look at the scriptures, you learn the who about God. 
With that in mind, Paul says in Romans 1.19, because what might be known, notice what might be known of God, not who, is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. People can know something about there being a God by looking through a microscope or a telescope or even looking around you. But it's not telling us who God is. You need the Scriptures for that. Nature reveals the reality. Scripture reveals the personality of God. So, talk a little bit about the plurality of God. Genesis 1.26, And God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now this is coming from the Hebrew word Elohim. There is a singular word for God. It's El. And you'll find it all the time in Hebrew names when you think of Elijah. El, Ijah, means my God is Jehovah. Elisha, my God is Savior. Daniel, my God is judge. Rachel, I could go on on Eliezer. You can see all the L's. Nathaniel, gift of God. And so a lot of L's in the Bible, they have a singular word for that. Whenever you have im, it's plural. How many of you know what a cherub is? It's an angel, right? What about cherubim? It's more than one. You know what a seraph is? It's an, it seems like a special category of angel, perhaps. What are seraphim? More than one. You know, in Isaiah chapter 6, it says, And I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and the right and the left were these seraphim. Those more than one that, you know, cover their faces and their feet as they fly. And so when you say Elohim, it's the plural for God. The Old Testament writers use this word to describe God over 2,500, what is 2,500 times instead of the word El. Because they knew something about, why would God say, let us make man in our image? Or they said, the man has become like us, and so he's evicted from the Garden of Eden. And the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 God went down and saw what man do has done and says, now nothing will be run. Let us scatter them uh, around the world. And that's Genesis 11, verse 7. Come, let us go down and confuse their language. So often, even in the Old Testament, first book, God is being presented as one God, but he's composed of more than one person. Now, why does Moses say, here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and then God is yet revealed in more than one person. The, the Hebrews, or rather the, the, the Egyptians, and the Greeks, and the Romans, and the Canaanites, they worshiped all these different gods that were at odds with each other, and they were fighting and tricking each other. And if you ever study Greek mythology going through school or high school or college, gods are all doing really mean things to each other and tricking each other and cursing each other and transforming each other, and they're, they're one's a god of the stone or the suns or the waters or whatever. They have their domains and they're all at war all the time. So when Moses says, our God is one, the way a husband and a wife are one, man was made in the image of God. A family is made in the image of God. It's one family, but there may be several personalities with different functions in the family. God says, we're made in his image. So you've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, and they are one God. But the word Elohim is used over and over again to explain that. Lewis Eady said, God does not live in isolation, not in the solitude of a single person, but in three persons in essence. Now, everything was created. Are you with me? But at some point we have to say, someone had to always be there to kick it all off, right? I mean, if you don't believe in God, then you need to believe that everything came from a Big Bang, and you say, well, what caused the Big Bang? And then you're stumped. Because there had to be a cause. There had to be something that would, you know, put the gas and the fire together and make it go bang. You had to have gas and fire. Something had to be there. Something had to decide to toss the match into the fire to create the universe. And if you ask physicists what caused the Big Bang, they say, well, there's a mystery. So you can either believe everything you see around you is a result of somehow these gas particles or something triggered this 
this um, singularity happened. Just an, an atom exploded. I, they, there's really no good answer for that question. Or you can believe there's an intelligent God and we don't know where he came from. He said he's eternal. And when you look at the size of the universe, it's getting easier to believe in eternity, friends. That there's just no end to God's infinite space. You know, it's fun to uh, travel around the country, but eventually you'll be singing that song, I've been everywhere. But in the resurrection, you'll never reach the end. You can go on a cruise through the cosmos that will never end. God is the Alpha and the Omega. He's from everlasting to everlasting. Before the mountains were brought forth, when he said, Moses said, God, how, how shall I explain to the Egyptians who you are? Which God are you? <laughs> and God said, don't try to compare me to their God of the river, their God of the sun. He says, I am that I am. I mean, I am the self-existent one. So that's a mystery. You know, we can't understand that, but God's always been there. So he's always lived. Now, uh, take just a moment and explain that there are different groups that have different views on the Trinity, and um, they're unbiblical, but they may use the word Trinity. Uh, I would respectfully disagree with my Catholic friends. Uh, they say they believe in the Trinity, but in reality they believe in what you would call the Holy Quartet. Because I think I put a picture on the screen right there. You've got God the Father, and they always put him as the old man with a beard. He's bald. I appreciate that. And you've got Jesus, and you've got the Holy Spirit, and they're crowning Mary. And you look at the attributes of Mary, and it seems like she's got the attributes of God. You pray to her and so forth. And, uh, but even without Mary, their definition of God uh, is a little strange. Uh, Thomas Aquinas said, The Father is the principle without principle. Well, we would agree with that part. This means God the Father is not caused or generated by another. But then you go to the Son. It says the Son is generated by the Father, which constitutes the person of the Son. What does that mean? When I hear about the Son being generated by the Father, I think about those car sales you drive by where they got that wild man that's blown up by air, and you turn off the electricity and he goes away. You press it on, he appears again. He's generated. And so I'm not sure I like that. It makes it sound like he had a beginning, which you'll see is not possible. And then the Holy Spirit is, uh, proceeds from the Father and Son, but not in a generative sense, but in spiration. Spiration means breathing the Spirit out. Again, that's different than what the typical Protestant believes about the divine, eternal nature of the God, the Spirit. Um, for those who are Seventh-day Adventists among us, the spirit of prophecy makes it pretty clear. This is from the book, First Selected Messages, page 296. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, who you have sent. In him was life, listen, original, unborrowed, underived. Didn't borrow it, didn't derive it from another. Always existed. Some people go to Proverbs chapter 8. And if you look in Proverbs chapter 8 and Proverbs chapter 9, there's a soliloquy that Solomon gives there on wisdom. It's a beautiful poem on wisdom. Wisdom cries out, listen to my voice. And it goes and talks about wisdom. And about a third of the way down that chapter, it says, I was with him in the beginning, I was brought forth. And they say, this is when God created Jesus at the very beginning. It's not talking about Jesus at all. The whole thing there is talking about wisdom. And then you go to chapter 9. Again, it's talking about wisdom, and it's using poetry there. So uh, think about this for a minute. How could Jesus have a beginning if the Bible says all things that were made were made by him, and without him was not anything made, nothing was made. How much was made without him? Nothing, including himself. How many things were made? All things. And as soon as you say that there was a time when Jesus was not, and then he was, he becomes a creature and not the creator. And I've got my anti-Trinitarian friends, and there's some good people out there. I, I don't want to uh, be unkind, but uh, they say, well, no, no, he wasn't created. He was begotten. I said, well, you can play with the words all you want. If he did not exist, and then the Father brings him into existence, he's a creation. And so Jesus was not created 
all things were made were made by him. And another thing, not everyone thinks about this. If you could describe God or define him biblically with one word, what is that word? God is love. Now, if you could go back into the infinite recesses of the past and find the time before God created anything, I suspect you'd have to go way back. Was God still love? Can you be love without anybody to love? No. Well, who's going to say your love? Or how do you express your love? Love is not love if it's not expressed. Don't forget that, gentlemen. <laughs> I sometimes have forgotten. That's how I'm telling you. <laughs> it must be expressed. And so God has always been love. So I don't go along with the... Um, our Catholic version of the Trinity. So you tell people you believe in the Trinity. They say, oh, you got that from the Catholics. And by the way, not everything that Catholics believe is wrong. So don't fall into that camp. I was just uh, touring with um, some of our board members are here. We were in Rome, touring the Vatican. <laughs> and you know what? When you go in there, they say, this is a place where people worship God, please be quiet. Take your hat off. You know, I wear my baseball cap and they said, your hat. Is. And hey, I'm all for reverence, aren't you? I think that Protestants have lost the sense of reverence for God. God is in his holy temple that all the earth keeps silent. So just because the Catholics believe something doesn't automatically make it wrong. And I've had some people take that position. Then there's some who believe in what you would call modalism, a form of tr Trinitarianism where what that means is they say, yeah, there's one God, but he reveals himself three different ways. It's like one creature with the three faces. And sometimes God shows his face through the Father, sometimes the Son, sometimes the Spirit. And I've got a picture here on the screen. They often use the illustration of water. Water can be in three forms. It can be liquid, it can be solid, it can be a gas. When it's frozen, it's solid. When it's steam, it's a gas. When it's water, it's water. And so you've got, uh, and they say, yeah, Jesus is when the Father came to earth and then he's also the Spirit and that doesn't work. You look at the baptism and here you've got God the Father. He's up in heaven because he's speaking and you've got God the Son who's in the water. God the Spirit is coming down in the form of a dove unless Jesus is doing ventriloquism when he says, this is my beloved Son. Uh, there are three different individuals. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus prays, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. You know, you got two different wills. you got two different persons, which is why we have marriage counseling. Right? Can I have an amen? amen. They're different people. They have different experience. Jesus said, I've got my will, and Father, there's your will, but I'm not going to do my will. I'm going to do your will. They're different individuals. So modalism doesn't work. You look in Daniel 7, 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Who is the Son of Man? That's Jesus, pre-incarnation. And he's coming to the Ancient of Days. Who is that? It's got to be God the Father, right? And then again, you have the baptism of Jesus that explains that. And by the way, the, not a lot of people believe in the modalism, but if you have any friends that are what you would call oneness Pentecostals, they believe in that. And they'll have an issue when you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because in the book of Acts, they baptize in the name of Jesus or the Lord Jesus, and they say, you know, you, you can't be baptized in Matthew 28. You've got to be baptized in the book of Acts. And they make a big deal about that. They say, if you're only, if you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you need to be rebaptized. Because they say, that's not true baptism. I cover it, you know, because I used to go to Pentecostal church. So when I baptize, I don't know if you ever caught it. I say, in the name of the Father, in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, in the name of the Holy Spirit. I cover all the bases. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Yes, it's worked so far. Seems like it's sticking. Then you got another group, and they're sub subordinationalism. And they, it's almost like you've got a military order in heaven where you've got God the Father, uh, he's the commander, and Jesus is a, a sergeant, and the Holy Spirit's a corporal. Or, and uh, while there may be, there are certainly different roles between the Father, Son, and Spirit, and it seems like Jesus has some form of willing 
uh, submission to the Father. Uh, I wouldn't call it subordinationalism. For instance, when the Bible says, God so loved the world, He gave His Son. Doesn't it sound like God the Father is taking some initiative there? When it says, God created all things through Jesus. It's like He said, Son, you want to create it? And so their, their relationship and their functions are certainly different. Otherwise, why would Jesus say it's expedient for you, you that I go away because unless I go away, the Holy Spirit can't come. I've got to go that he may come. And so um, there, there are different roles, but we don't believe in subordinationalism. And by the way, that was John 14, 28. You've heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you'd rejoice because I am going to the Father and my Father is greater than I. So certainly when Christ was on the earth, the Bible says as a man, f folks ask me questions all the time. They say, Pastor Doug, D Jesus did not know the day and the hour of his coming. You remember Christ in Matthew, he says, no man knows the day or the hour, not the angels, not the sun. And I say, how could Jesus be God and not know the day and the hour of his coming? Well, when he was on earth, he laid aside his divinity and so, by the way, how would he explain to his disciples, yep, I'm coming back in 2050. To what? They didn't even have ACDC. No, not ACDC. They did not even have <laughs> a, <laughs> a, ADBC back then. I mean, it wouldn't have made any sense to them for one thing. So they said, what's the date? They didn't have dates back then. And so, but do you think that Jesus now at the right hand of the Father is saying, and the father's holding a piece of paper like a fortune cookie, and he says, what's there? I got the date of your return. Oh, can, you, can I show? No, you can't see it. It's a secret. I'll let you know when you're ready. No, of course he knows now, but on earth he didn't have all knowledge swirling around in his head like God the Son does now prior to the incarnation. And then you've got what they call Arianism. Now, that's, they, don't, they are certainly not Trinitarianism, uh, Trinitarians, but um, that name comes from Arius, who was a Christian presbyter in Alexandria about 250 to 336. And um, he taught that Jesus was created at some point and that the Holy Spirit is really the force or the power through which God operates. We'll get to that in just a minute. So here's the big question. I'm not going to take, as I talk about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I'm not going to take very much time trying to convince you that God the Father is God. Uh, I don't run into too many Christians that have a problem with the Father being God. So we all good on that? We can move right along. Here's what the problem is. Is Jesus God? Is he fully God? What does the Bible say? I'll tell you a story. Before I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I just wanted to know what's the Bible say? What's the truth? And I studied with Latter-day Saints, a lot of wonderful people. I studied with Jehovah Witnesses. And I remember studying with Jehovah Witnesses, eventually this subject comes up because they do not believe in the Trinity. They believe Jesus was created. And they showed me several verses and it kind of shook me up and I, I finally came to the place where I said, Lord, I don't care. I had not joined the Adventist church yet. I just said, I want to be a Bible Christian. So I said, if it's true, show me. And I started studying this subject very carefully and it became very clear to me that their teaching was not correct. I showed him in the Bible where it said um, when Christ rose from the dead and Thomas falls down at his feet when he finally sees Thomas and he says, my Lord and my God. They said, yeah, yeah, well, he wasn't addressing Jesus. He looked at Jesus and said, my Lord, and then he looked up and said, and my God. I said, well, you're reading something into the scripture that's not there. So what about in, in John, first, uh, first chapter of John where it says, and the word was God. They said, well, here in our New World Translation, it says the word was a God, and they make it a small God. And they had to do a lot of gymnastics with a lot of verses to come up with their teaching. I said, oh, no, no, no. And then I just went way beyond that. And, well, let me give you some of my verses here. Is Jesus God? Matthew 123, everyone's singing this time of year, they will call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. God came to tabernacle with us. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Who's this prophecy about? 
Everyone knows it's about Jesus. And the government will be upon his shoulder. He will be the king of kings. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. He's just not a little G. He's Mighty God, big G. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's also our Father in that he created all things. Romans 9, 5. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all. Blessed forever. Amen. Is that clear? Paul said, Jesus Christ, who is God over all. I mean, can you get a dictionary definition? If you don't accept evidence like this, what evidence will you accept? It's pretty clear. God over all. Hebrews 1.8 now here Paul is quoting back to the Old Testament and he said, but the, he, to the Son he says, thy throne, he's speaking to the Son, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. The Son is being told, your throne, O God, is an eternal throne. So another reason I believe Jesus is God, does the Bible tell us we should only worship God? Isn't that one of the commandments? Did Jesus receive worship? He did. Matthew chapter 28, verse 9. And they went to tell his disciples, Behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. That means worship. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. He did not kick them away and say, Don't do that. He received worship. Hebrews 1, 6. Let all the angels of God worship him. Right, and you can see that at the incarnation. The angels sang. And uh, they were worshiping Jesus. Revelation 7.11, all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and they fell down on their faces before the throne and it's the Lamb on the throne and they worship God. So, he's worshiped. The Bible says God created. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning God created. You go to the Gospel of John, what do we read? In John chapter 1 verse 3, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. It doesn't say that He came forth then. He was there. It's present tense. All things were made through Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And so it's pretty clear to see that uh, God is eternal. Then um, Ephesians 3 verse 9 God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 6, I'm sorry, Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and are on earth. How many things created by him? All things, visible and invisible, that means the angels, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things and in him all things consist it's his power of God that holds all things together and then I like this Hebrews 1 verse 1 God who at sundry times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son who is appointed heir of all things through whom he made the worlds not just our world, but all worlds. Another definition for God, the Bible says there's only one Savior. And by the way, when I was studying with the Jehovah Witnesses, a lot of these things, this is worship Jehovah only, then it says worship Jesus. It says Jehovah only is our Savior, but then it says Jesus is our Savior. Jehovah created, it says Jesus created. And I remember studying with some of my JW friends and they, they got a little rattled by that. I said, so when you're... Uh, when you're talking about Jehovah, Jesus is Jehovah. Amen. This is another name for the one God. Isaiah 43, 11, I, even I, the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Jude, verse 25, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. 1 John 4, 4, 14, and we've seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Another thing about God is the omnipresence of God. Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, wherever you go. Is that just me, or did he say it to you too? So when we all disperse after church, is he with all of us? That's called omnipresence. 
Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Did you know they say, wherever you go, there you are. But wherever you go, God is with you. He sees all things. He's self-existent. John 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In him, John 1, 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. In Revelation 1, 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. He who is, who was, and is to come. Far back as you can go backwards in the present, in the future. He's not confined by time. That's why God can take a prophet into the future and show him things. Because God sees all time at one time easily. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. You know, there's some churches that believe that our God, this is actually the Latter-day Saints, that our God was once a lesser God, but he's worked his way up to being God of worlds. And, um, you know, when I studied with my Mormon friends, I said, so your God has grown. Yes. I said, is he all powerful? Yes. I said, can he learn anything? Yes. So how can he be all knowing and learn something? The only other way you can do that is to be a teenager. <laughs> Go to school and be all knowing at the same time. Right? No. So I said, if God is learning anything, then he's not all knowing. So that's got serious problems, that teaching. The other thing is, he knows men's hearts. The Bible says, God, and by the way, the verse for this is 1 Kings 8.39. Solomon, when he prayed, he said, Lord, you who know all men's hearts, for you and you only know the thoughts of men. Did Jesus know what people were thinking? Now, the devil can tempt you. He can put thoughts in your mind. And he can look at your body language and your expression and see if he's getting through. But he can't read your mind. But Jesus knows every thought that you think. He knows what's in your heart. You can read here Mark 2, verse 8. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned within themselves, he answered them. When Simon at the dinner was reasoning, if this man's a prophet, he'd know who and what manner of woman this is that's touching him, for she's a sinner. Jesus knew what he was thinking. And then he responded to his thoughts. Uh, Jesus asked the disciples, what were you arguing about on the road? They tried to get out of earshot, but he knew what they were thinking. They said, oh, we weren't talking about anything. They were talking about who was the greatest. God knows all things. He knows our hearts and what we're thinking. John chapter 2, verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Amen. John 5, 17, But Jesus answered them, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews all sought all the more to kill him, not only because he broke the Sabbath, at least they were accusing him of that, but because, but because that saying God was his Father, making himself equal with God. And by the way, not only did Jesus say, I and my Father are one, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And Christ taught his prior existence by saying, Abraham longed to see my day, and he saw it. And so even way back before Abraham, Jesus existed. He existed in eternity past. So um, there's no question about that, the preexistence of the Lord. In John 1, verse 30, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who's preferred before me, for he was before me. Why would John the Baptist, the older, say about Jesus, he was before me? Because of his prior existence. And then John 17, Jesus makes it clear in verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory that I had with you before the world was. So Jesus is eternal. Jesus is God. You look at all the definitions of God, creator, savior, all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent, self-existent. Uh, Jesus is God. Now what about the Holy Spirit? This is where a lot of people struggle. And I even hear it in our prayers. I'll catch myself praying it. We sometimes talk about the Holy Spirit like it's a force or that he's uh, just a power. But the Bible's pretty clear. It says he's a he. In Acts chapter 5, verse 3, when Ananias and Sapphira lied to Peter, Peter said, you have not lied to men. 
says you've lied to the Holy Spirit and in lying to the Holy Spirit you have lied to God so if you're lying to the Holy Spirit you're lying to God John 16 13 however he when the spirit of truth has come he will guide you into all truth over and over again it says he 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 and you know it, all the way in the beginning of the Bible there chap, Genesis chapter 1 it says the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters and if you go to Revelation chapter 22 the last chapter in the Bible it talks about God the words that close the book are even so come Lord Jesus and just before that it says the Spirit and the bride say come you've got the Holy Spirit all the way from Genesis to Revelation he is not just an impersonal force Amen. that guides us Amen. how many of you have a GPS in your car or your phone that should be just about everybody right it's amazing that we survive without that and you think we would have been extinct based on the way we depend on them now if they were all taken away we might be right so when you're driving down the road and you got your GPS on and uh, I, I don't know how you've got yours program mine is a female voice and it says 500 feet turn right well I just remember something else I need to do that's on up the street and I think well I'm going to keep going because I'm going to stop there first get some gas and I drive past the turn it said now that really hurt my feelings <laughs> I asked you to turn I asked in a very nice way and you just totally ignored me see if I ever talk to you again is that what it does yeah. couldn't care less it just says recalculating I saw a really funny commercial one time or a little cartoon in a magazine where station wagon is driving up this windy road and steep mountain cliff and it goes off the edge through the guardrail and you see this little cloud blurb and it says recalculating <laughs> <laughs> or it says make a u-turn matter of fact I, sometimes I just have to turn off my GPS because it keeps telling me what to do and I don't want to keep hearing it I know and I almost feel like I need to apologize and say will you be quiet for a minute please I'm gonna come I'll turn around I promise isn't that dumb you know why it's dumb it is an impersonal force but what does the Bible say in Ephesians chapter 4 about the Holy Spirit verse 30 grieve not the Holy Spirit wherewith you are sealed for the day of redemption can you grieve your GPS when you don't turn when it tells you to turn no <laughs> I won't ask you for a show of hands how many of you have one of these Amazon Alexa's or you've got the Siri or the thing where you talk and it talks to you and and I'll I'll say you know what's the temperature tomorrow and it'll tell me and then it says something I didn't ask for it says would you like me to give you free notifications about uh, your favorite news stand channel and I say no thank you <laughs> and I'm thinking why am I saying thank you <laughs> I say no be quiet <laughs> someone's like well, this artificial intelligence is kind of scary isn't it we're starting to talk to these things like they got personality the Holy Spirit's not AI it's real he is real the Bible tells us it's a him you read through the book of Acts it says the Holy Spirit told us to go here and then the Holy Spirit forbade us from going there and Jesus said when he he could have used it Jesus knew the word it he uses the word it other places he could have said force he said he 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 Jesus gives him personality don't try and take it away Holy Spirit is real when he comes he will guide you into all truth Elijah heard a still small voice you know I understand that the um, some of the ancient nomads when they were traveling across the deserts that they would um, keep a homing pigeon with them they'd feed it and take care of it but they kept a thread tied on its leg and they'd get into these sandstorms that were so dense that these caravans could not see the sun they couldn't calculate where they were but the bird always knew what home was and they'd let the bird go and hang on to the thread and it would fly like a compass needle directly towards home and they could get their direction by following the bird and I should also say the different pictures that we're showing about God the Father so there's no picture you know these are what you call artist concepts or AI concepts these days don't put a lot of heat in that you know we're not supposed to worship images just 
Sometimes we're trying to figure out how do I visualize God, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. God's always the Father. We can kind of give him the old man look. It just wouldn't seem right if he was younger than Jesus, right? Call him the Father. And then Jesus, you know, we got our typical visual pictures of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, he's a tough one. Often it's a dove because he came down like a dove on Jesus. Sometimes fire. Pentecost, fire. Jesus compares him to the wind in John chapter 3. So it's, he's, he's a nebulous person. He's a spirit. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Amen? You've got to be able to pray for the Holy Spirit to understand God. Now, I'll share a little testimony with you. I experienced a miraculous healing this week. I had a rapid onset of blindness. I was sitting in the Amazing Facts evangelism meeting, listening to all the evangelists in the boardroom give their reports, and I was trying to read the material, and I could not see. And I thought, oh, I forgot my glasses. I put my hand on. I had my glasses on. And I, no matter where I looked, I'm looking out, and everything is going bad, and I thought, oh, man, if my vision has gone this bad this quickly, I'm going to be blind in 30 days. Everything was fuzzy. I was blinking. I was rubbing my eye. And uh, I'm beginning to think, how long will I be able to keep my job? I'll have them lead me out on stage and I'll preach from memory. I'll put an earpiece in my ear. I'll pre-record my sermons. Maybe I can learn Braille. All this crazy stuff's going through my mind. I'm exaggerating a little bit. But... Um, then it occurred to me, I was videotaping this morning and I've got special glasses I wear for videotaping that don't have any glare because they don't have any lens. <laughs> <laughs> and here I was sitting there not hearing anything that's going on around me, processing how I was going to live a life as a blind man. <laughs> and it was because I didn't have my glasses on. I'm going like this and going, oh Lord, please heal me. <laughs> What have I done? <laughs> I'll tell you, friends, I was so happy. I didn't tell any of the evangelists. They don't know what was going on because, you know, I thought they're going to say, no, he doesn't have eye problems. He's got brain problems. <laughs> and it's much more serious. <laughs> and I put my glasses on. I thought, praise the Lord. <laughs> I've been healed. It's a true story. <laughs> it makes a big difference. You see things differently when you've got the right glasses on, don't you? And when you read the Bible, you need to make sure that you're reading it, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and life. And whatever we can understand about God, we need to know it needs to be revealed according to the word by the spirit. The most important reason that we study this subject, Jesus said in John chapter 17, the first three verses, this is eternal life that we might know thee. Eternal life is to know him. What will the Lord say to the lost? They say, Lord, Lord, but he says, I never knew you. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Not knowledge about facts, but knowledge about who God is. There's no higher study than to study God. Because what is a Christian? A Christian is someone who wants to be like Christ, who is God. We want to be godly. Amen? We want to be like our Lord and our Savior. We're going to sing about that as we close our service today. And uh, the hymn number, I've got it right here. Number 73, Holy, Holy, Holy. Why don't you stand with me and we'll sing together and then we'll have our closing prayer.